My name is Andrea Cimadoro. I'm the National Development Manager for Cooling System here in Australia. And uh, topic today is diesel genset. And today we're going to do part one. We're talking about e transfer solution. Let's see what we're going to discuss about today. So we will talk a little bit about genset basics, the basic layout, how they look like. We'll definitely talk about cooling system and make all the consideration and all the parameter and all the variable that we have to master in the cooling system department in order to come up with a perfect uh, cooling package solution. Last but not least, uh, we look at the type of engine cooling system. Uh, this is related to, to the cooling system consideration and design. And finally, we will look quickly about the type of installation. So let's start. Let's talk about the type and the rating of the genset. So we work, first of all, with majority of the engine manufacturer, the prime mover, so-called, and we got several installations in Australia and globally. So this is how they look like. They can be either containerized, either small or on a skid. But let's start with the small baby, the portable or mobile one. So this can be driven and the fuel can be natural gas or diesel or gasoline. And these are, let's say, covering the small side of the market, the small range. And they can be, let's say, from 10, 20 kilowatt up to 200, 250 kilowatt or kVA. When things become a little bit bigger than that, well, that's definitely hard to transport it or to make it portable or mobile, like, like we call it. So then we got the medium range, which we're talking about. It's, let's say, from 250 kilowatt up. And then we got also that range can go up to even 3000 kilowatt, 3 megawatt. And definitely we got the large side also on the natural gas type. So it's a recent development where a lot of engine manufacturers use natural gas to run this engine. And definitely, it's a, let's say, it's a better fuel. It's a low emission type of fuel. Like now, I like to, to talk about the rating. Uh, following a, an ISO norm, the 8528, we can divide the, the genset in four different configurations or operation let's say L what are the variable well definitely the load or the operating hours so this is a little schematic but we can talk a little bit more about so starting from the top starting from the low amount of hour used we call it esp so emergency standby power so the emergency standby power are genset that are there to be fired up in case of an emergency. So we are talking about data center, we are talking about emergency uh, backup on an hospital, on, a, on an emergency applications or, or, or uh, uh, buildings and so on. So those are the last used one, uh, let's say. Then when we start to using a little bit more and, and we're talking about 500 hours each year, we call it the LTP, so limited time running power. So this is uh, an application where the operation is almost uh, in on-off condition, but definitely not every day, not, ev not a 24-7 application. Below that, we got the what we call COP, continuous power. And this is a rating where it's continuous, it's 24-7 and uh, is a constant load. So what's the difference between the COP and the PRP, prime power? The prime power is it's exactly the same, 24 hour, but the load, the variable, it's a variable. It, the load is not constant. So that's the difference between PRP and COP. But both of them are definitely unlimited number of hours annually. So 24 seven operation. So once it's clear the different rating and the different type, Let's talk about the cooling system consideration. Well, we have to juggle several parameters in my department. We have now summarized those one into 12. So I'm going to go very quickly on, on all of them. So we definitely have to know the engine brand, the type. We, know, we need to know the duty cycle, like we just discussed about. We need to know the number of cooling circuit, how many we are. So sometimes we, uh, in some application, we have three circuit. We got the jacket water, the charger, and the fuel. 
typical maximum three circuit. But if, for example, it's a gen set that is also hydraulically driven, we might have a four uh, circuit to cool the hydraulic. Also, we need the type of glycol. Virtually always is 50-50 the glycol mix, but it can change engine to engine. Of course, we look at the installation environment. You know, if it's indoor, if it's outdoor, if it's remote, if it's skid mounted, if it's containerized. So that's also a variable that affect the design of the cooling package. Space constraint, that's, uh, I would say, the, the strong point and, and also the strong point of differentiation from IDA. We're very strong and we shine when we, there is a space constraint. With our technology, we manage to do a package in a very, very confined space. So that's a, it's a constraint, but it's also our biggest point of differentiation. So we got different type of uh, fan drive, can be electrical, can be engine driven with a fan mounted on a PTO, or it can be hydraulically driven. And um, noise, noise is another driving point together with space who are the two challenges that we have every day. And the limiting ambient temperature is definitely a consideration, a design factor. In Australia, we definitely are uh, let's say in the higher range so we do installation package with lit 45 50 55 even 56 recently and we are not scared about it. it's just a matter of sizing it and sizing it correctly so we also uh, look at the ventilation and we also provide consultancy and know-how at australian level but global level as idac a lot of oem are coming to us and they are asking us to cooperate in designing how the air travel inside a containerized installation. So we got that knowledge within IDAC and we are happy to share it with anybody that wants to partner with IDAC. So we also have another variable, which is the expansion tank, which uh, often is either forgotten or, uh, say, considered as a simple piece of equipment. The reality is that it's also a quite complex uh, part of the cooling package. And we also try to help every OEM and every customer that wants to develop a special package for us. So it can be integrated. Sometimes we integrate it. Sometimes we put it remotely. Sometimes we put it uh, on top of the, as a separated, but on top still of the cooling package. So we've developed over the time and the year, a lot of different configurations. But what is the challenge that we have? Well, the challenge is that with all the parameter that I described, with all this consideration, it is hard to master it if you don't have an help. And the help from either comes from a software called Cooley. So Cooley is a, a, an energy thermal management simulation software uh, massively used in the automotive sector. IDAC has acquired Cooley 15 years ago, and since then, all the project, all the complex uh, combi or genset project that has been developed worldwide, that's been developed with the use of Cooley. So we currently use Cooley version 12 globally. HIDAC has got globally five licenses and they are shared around the globe. And we are more than 40 users from HIDAC uh, modeling, sizing and, and simulating cooling package before we actually build it. So Cooley is definitely intelligent software and is, uh, is giving you a quick and easy solution. It's very flexible and uh, it has definitely cut the time to market from IDAC side and uh, very easy to learn. And we reach now after 15 years of usage an accuracy between the simulated value to the real genset package about 1%. So on the right side of the slide, you can see a few brands that we are already sized and uh, installed in the Australian market. So we work with majority of brands and they're working, they're working fine. So one of the power, what is our coolie power? Let's uh, like the slide described. Well, one of the biggest power that we have, it's our wind tunnel, which is located in, in Switzerland. And the wind tunnel is our simulation database generator. So the, the wind tunnel works 24 seven, seven days a week and uh, is testing new design cooling package, new design matrix, new design air fins and turbolator. And it put back this uh, data into Cooley. So that's our power. 
And the, the wind tunnel is definitely giving us a real performance result. On uh, And coupled with Cooley, we can simulate something that doesn't exist within a matter of a few hours modeling. So another thing that are, I'm very proud of it, and I like to uh, put it out loud, is that we are the only Cooley training center in Australia. So IDAC Training Center Australia uh, can train Cooley users. So we got a few people certified to do this job, and definitely we start and we're doing regularly to uh, train other IDAC user, but we can train anybody on the use of Cooley and the, the modeling of uh, thermal management uh, problems. So this is the output of Cooley. This is what we give to customers. So every time we do a genset uh, cooling package, the customer receive a PDF with all the parameter split out of the Cooley software. They receive the performance curve, where is actually we are working in. So we got the cooling power, we got the pressure drop. They receive the simulated fan curve. So this is some of the parameters that we give to the people. We give the airflow, we give the total heat load, we got the in and exit of air, in and exit of fluid temperature, noise level, fan power, pressure across the core, pressure across uh, the air side, and so on. So once we have clarified the parameter or the, the challenge that we have, how we solve it, by the use of, of an evoluted thermal simulation software. Let's see how many engine cooling system we have. So how many they are out there that we need to challenge or master it. So let's start with a, a basic one. So before we jump into the model, I like to do one thermal consideration. So I put my fuel, I put my diesel, and this is generating me an energy. Okay, so this fuel energy is transformed into exhaust energy, and we try to recover it, for example, with an evaporator, is transferred into coolant energy, and that's the one that we try to recuperate as a cooler guys, and then is, of course, transformed into mechanical energy, and that's what is going to drive either my generator, if it's a gen set, or a pump, if it's a pump set. So how many cooling type there are in the market. Let's start with the first one. Let's start with a basic one. We call it jacket water after cool. So we have just a radiator for the jacket water and we have either no uh, radiator for the after cooling for the charger system or we have no charger system at all. So small little diesel engine, they are what we call naturally aspirated and we're talking about little little baby, little two-cylinder, three-cylinder, or four-cylinder diesel engine up to, for example, three liter, they can be naturally aspirated. So what does it mean? It means that they don't need to cool the jacket, the charge air system. So it's only one radiator, and it's only the water type. So this is the first type. Then we got another type, which we call it air-to-air -air after cooling. And we are talking about engine, let's say from three liter up, we're talking about from, let's say, 40 to 200 kilowatt, where we need to cool both circuits. That means we need to call the jacket water system and we need to call the, the, the intercooler, the charge air system. So in cooling side, the radiator that cool the air is called intercooler or charge air cooler, so we have definitely two circuits. So jacket water and charge air cooler. Sometimes separate, sometimes one on top of each other, sometimes side to side. Let's talk about the big boy. So when engine become big, big means 500 kilowatt up, what is happening is that there is a water cooled plate heat exchanger on board of the engine. So what does it mean is that this plated exchanger, one side has got the charge air from the hot air side, turbo. The other side is cooled by jacket water. And in this case, we still have two circuit, but we have two pump for two loop systems. So that's why it's called 2P2L. And a lot of uh, engine manufacturer powertrain company call it HT, high temperature, or LT, low temperature. 
So this is a typical schematic of an HTLT configuration, which is a typical constant situation when you got an engine which is 1000 kilowatt up to 3000 kilowatt. So 1000, 1 megawatt up to 3 megawatt. So we only cool water glycol and the water glycol of one circuit goes to jacket the engine that's why it's called jacket water because it's like a jacket that you uh, you run around the engine and then the other one it's the lt the low temperature is going through a plate cooler and is cooling the air side last but not least in idac being a, a strong filtration company we condition also the diesel and that means that we can provide to customer the diesel filtration, both, let's say, in a storage or in a, as a diesel pre-care. But we also condition it with a cooler because conditioning means taking care about filtering a fluid and taking care that the fluid is at the right temperature. So the proper fuel conditioning system, it has a cooler and a filter. And so where is our fuel cooler? Normally, generally, that's a courtesy of Caterpillar. It's actually after the engine in the return fuel to the main fuel tank. That's where our fuel cooler live. Sometimes we integrate the fuel cooler on packages. Sometimes we leave the fuel cooler on a side, for example, inside a genset containerized application. Let's look at some type of installation. I think that's what makes everybody connecting uh, what I was describing before to some real pictures, some reality, something that we can touch and see every day in the market. So let's start with uh, what we call a factory mounted type. So factory mounted type is because we work with local OEM uh, globally and we mount, we supply the cooling package and the factory, the OEM mounted straight into a, a commercial engine. So that's a, a baby engine. We are talking about three kilowatt to 10 kilowatt. That's the power of this baby engine and um, two cylinder or three cylinder. Then growing up with power, the, the displacement of this little boy is almost like a motorbike engine, like, uh, you know, a two cylinder 800 cc. Growing up with, for example, a two liter, that's a natural aspirated two liter diesel engine, four cylinder, no intercooler. So you see the IDAC package only for the radiator side, like we were discussing before. Then we can go up, and on this case, for example, it's a three-liter four-cylinder turbo diesel, not intercooled. So it's got a turbo, but the turbo is not strong enough that needs to be cooled down. So in this case, you see the integration of a radiator for the water jacket, and inside we also incorporated the fuel cooler. So this is two circuit fuel jacket water, single circuit, this one water, single circuit here water. Going up, we go into, for example, five liter engine, a bigger boy, we start talking about four or six cylinder. Then we have the water jacket, then we got the fuel line and we got the charge air cooler uh, or intercooler on, on top of this package, for example. So this is just to give you an idea of what a factory mounted means. So the factory makes everything on this kit, the local OEM, and then what are the possible applications? Well, either they use it for a pump, and then in this case become a pump set, or they use it for a, an alternator, and in this case becomes a, a gen set, a generator set. The pump one, it's also peculiar because we have changed the type of uh, cooling package. In this case, we got a brace plate exchanger instead of a standard uh, plate and bar uh, radiator type because the application has got a lot of water available. So we can transform this type of cooling package. So after the factory mounted, the other type of installation is the containerized. And this is the type where IDAC, I would say, shine the most because the challenge here is how we make the air travel into it. Another challenge is what noise level we have. And the third challenge is can we fit in that amount of space, 20 foot, 30 foot, special containerized. So those are challenges 
that that make us shine. So in this case, on the left and on the right side, you got an installation where we got full fan HTLT arrangement type. So we got the cold air getting in at the front of the container, being exhaust at the top, and we separate the hot side which we call the engine side by the cooling package. And we do a ventilation just to ventilate the engine. Because remember that gen engine generate heat and generate quite a lot of heat. Some engine, you know, when we're talking about two or three megawatt, they generate 100 to 200 kilowatt of heat, you know? So when you put it in a cage, in a container, this heat has to go away. So sometimes we use our fan to drive this heat out. Sometimes it's too hard. So we better separate the cooling package from the hot area, from the engine area, and we do an arrangement like that. So another type of installation is uh, remote. So remote for IDAC is also on top of the roof. We classify that as a remote installation. And in this case, I'd like to show you this is... Uh, an engine which sometimes we have this kind of application where we call it thermally unbalanced. That means that the HT circuit is bigger than the LT circuit. So you can see the H circuit has got two cooling package. The LT circuit has got only one cooling package. Sometimes we have this kind of application and they are very common when the engine is driven by gas. Why is that? Because the gas combustion is uh, different than the diesel one, create definitely more heat, especially in the radiator, in the water jacket side. And therefore, you got an HT circuit, which is the double of the single one. I mean, say that we can have a remote also uh, far away from the engine. And there uh, we always uh, collaborate with the engine manufacturer because when we start to move the radiator far away, from the container or far away from the place where the engine is, like you can see on those pictures on the right, some challenging are rising. And it's mainly pressure drop of piping, pressure drop. Will the pump of the engine cope with that? Because don't forget that who is delivering us the water glycol for this radiator is actually the pump of the engine, which is made to power up and to pump a fluid with a radiator which is close to the engine, not far away. So this is one of the challenges that we always have on remote outside installation, even on the roof. Last but not least, I would say is a remote installation where, for example, we share the load with a, a brace or a plated exchanger. So what we can do is that we can put a system. We either also make accumulators so we can put a bladder accumulator, blade accumulator, where it's mainly used to act as an expansion tank. For the plated exchanger, we put a plated exchanger inside close to the engine and we put, let's say, a table cooler, which we call a dry cooler outside. So what is the advantage of, of an installation like that? Well, we share the load. Sometimes what is happening is that the size of the container is too small to put all the rack of the table cooler on top. So we are forced to share the thermal load between two different cooling types. We call this hybrid system, and we share the thermal load between a plated exchanger or a gasket and a table cooler or what we call dry cooler or uh, that act as, a, let's say, a secondary condenser, if you want, if you allowed me the terms outside the container. So this is it for today. Big topic, uh, genset, and that's why we decided to split it in two parts. So my recommendation is stay tuned for part two. Thank you very much for tonight and uh, until the next webinar. See you.